I'm Mara Laszlo. I'm a graduate student in Jim Henkin's lab at the Museum of Comparative Zoology and Harvard University. I study evolution and development in frogs, and today I'm going to talk to you about diversity in frogs and how that diversity arises through natural selection. So like all animals, frogs need to find food, water, and reproduce. Frogs have an additional challenge, though. They need to stay moist and make sure that they don't dry out. What does a frog look like? They might be green like this tree frog or brown and kind of bumpy like this toad. But no matter what they look like, all frogs share some traits. They have no tail and they have shortened spine and special hip bones that allow them to jump. Frogs actually can come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. For example, the strawberry poison dart frog is a beautiful bright red and blue. The Bushveld rain frog has a really round body and a flat face. And the Suriname toad that you can see here has an extremely flat body and long skinny fingers. The pixie bullfrog has a really round body and a gigantic mouth. All of the differences we just saw are differences in the morphology of a frog. Morphology means the physical way a frog looks. You might have also heard these physical features called adaptations. Frogs don't just differ physically, frogs also have different behaviors. And they even develop in different ways, which means that frogs have different life cycles. For example, while most frogs need to live in a moist environment, some frogs have special behaviors that allow them to live in dry conditions. They are able to store water inside their bodies and burrow underground during dry spells. They develop a mucus cocoon that helps them keep moist and stay very still to conserve water. This is called estivating. Here you can see this frog shedding its mucus cocoon. You might also notice that this frog has a round body built for storing water. Together, these morphological and behavioral adaptations allow this species to live in a dry environment. Frogs also develop differently from each other. That means that they have different life cycles. These two tadpoles are different species of frogs, one that lives in temporary pools that will eventually dry up, and one that lives in a fast-flowing stream. So the frog that develops in temporary pools completes metamorphosis, so going from an egg to an adult in about 30 days, and they're ready to live on land. In contrast, the tadpole that lives in the fast-flowing streams spends at least a year as a tadpole feeding and growing into an adult. So why are there so many different types of frogs? Why is there such diversity in color, shape, size, behavior, and development? Specifically, what's the name of the process that causes species to look, act, and develop differently from each other? You might have heard of the term evolution, or evolution through natural selection. The different features that we just discussed, which you might have heard called adaptations, arise because of natural selection. Evolution through natural selection is the reason that the small-headed tree frog has big toes that it uses to grip onto trees. And evolution through natural selection is also the reason the leopard frog is green with brown spots. And this coloring helps the frog blend in with its habitat. But exactly how does this process work? We define evolution as the change in inherited characteristics of a population over time. How do these changes happen? Evolution has four key components. Variation, inheritance, selection, and time. So we're going to look at an example that shows evolution through natural selection of color. Let's look at the first component, variation. Let's say you have a population of green frogs. They're all the same species of frog, but like any population, there's variation in color. So some are a little bit brighter green and some are a little more brown green. The next component is inheritance. The colors you see in each frog is inherited from the frog's parents in their DNA, just like your hair color is inherited from your parents. The next component is natural selection. As you can see, green frogs are well camouflaged from predators in the trees. Which frogs do you think are the least likely to be eaten? If there is a frog that is a little darker or a little lighter, it is more likely to be picked off by a predator. So this population of frogs stays green. Let's imagine, over a long period of time, the climate where these frogs live changes from a wet tropical climate to a drier, warmer climate. There are fewer green trees in this climate. Now which frogs do you think are the most likely to be eaten? Now the population has more brown frogs than green frogs compared to the initial population. The final component of evolution through natural selection is time. Over a long period of time, as the climate changed and the landscape became drier and less green, 
the population gradually evolved to be less green too. The new population of frogs is almost completely brown. Because of evolution through natural selection, frogs have interesting morphologies. Let's look at some different examples of these interesting adaptations. Keep in mind that these adaptations allow these frogs to survive in their environment. We see lots of variation in feet, body shape, and head shape. Wallace's flying frog has lots of webbing between each of its toes. In contrast, the American toad has less webbing between the toes on its hind legs and none at all between the toes on its front legs. The fire-bellied toad has a very streamlined body and head and eyes that rise above its head. Remember the estivating northern burrowing frog that we saw lives in a dry place? The shovel-nosed frog also has a round body and a pointy head that's shaped like a shovel. Now that you've seen some adaptations, let's look at real environments where frogs live. Think about the types of adaptations that would help a frog survive in that environment. So some frogs, like this magnificent tree frog, live in trees. Frogs can live completely underground. Some frogs live completely underwater, like this African dwarf frog. And some frogs live in leaf litter. When we're studying frog morphology at Harvard, we can just go to the herpetology collections and look at a specimen. We want you to also be able to look at these specimens by looking them up on the computer or by looking at models of specimens. The specimens that you're gonna look at today come from the herpetology collection at Harvard. Using a technique called photogrammetry, we reconstructed a 3D model of several specimens like this one. Then we used a 3D printer to make a model of the specimen. And finally, we painted the frogs to look as realistic as possible. Now, you're gonna look at some of these models of frogs that live in nature and make some predictions about where and how they live based on their morphology or their adaptations. We hope that you enjoy learning about frog biodiversity and exploring the herpetology collections.